This interview is for the archives of the Elysee, and we are with... Um, My name is Arian Kaganov. And he is a magnificent and momentous filmmaker who made a film on, using a very small gadget called a mobile telephone. That's all I know about him. Could you Great, tell us well more? that's enough. <laughs> that's it. Magnificent and momentous. I would like that on my tombstone. You've just killed me. Great, thank you. What, in what way killed? Well, I mean, you can't top that. So if I'm already magnificent and momentous, I may as well die right now. I'm not sure, because many people strive for peace before death. Strive for peace of what? Peace of everything. Ah, but you already have everything, so why strive for it? Do you actually feel that? I don't feel it, I know it. How do you know it? I know it internally through the mechanism called my soul. And how do you know that you've got a soul? That's difficult. Um, in as much as I know anything, I know that I have a soul. So if, if one is going to measure knowledge and, and test my knowledge, I would say the only thing that I feel absolutely sure about is the, is the soul, which is not something I have, but the soul has me, because the soul is the universal soul, which has all of us. How there's you know there's that? only one soul. How do you know it? It's not how you know that, it's how deeply you know it. Because um, for many years I've spoken with great conviction and passion about my beliefs, only to realize that they were just beliefs and not untrue. Really? And so words like soul and universal and yes. suspicious about it. And as one should be. Mm -hmm. So when as did you first be. sense this thing that gets called soul? Well, there was never a first. There was no first. The, the, the sense that you talk of, the sensation, was always there, and then the body manifested around that. So it's the other way around, if you see what I mean. You could How do you know your body manifested around it? You could, you could more specifically say to me, when did I first know that I had a body? That's nice, yes. Yeah. That, that would be more meaningful to me. Yes. In terms of what I know. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, when? Well, I can't say. You know, to, to put that sensation into words vulgarizes the texture of the sensation. Because words are such vulgar approximations of the things that we're trying to talk about that we can't. So what is your soul? Where are your emotions? Um, my emotions very often are on my sleeve because I'm a very emotional person. Mm -hmm. um, w w Traditionally, in Western cultures, we assume that emotions are in our hearts. But I think... Yeah, I mean, I have to speak very specifically for myself, is that my emotions are all me. I, I am all emotion, basically. I'm very emotional. I, I have a lot of difficulty understanding logic and rationality and specific things like that. So I would say, if you ask me where are my emotions, I would rather say where are they not. Um, okay, that's also good. I mean, to me. So, and, um, uh, so, do you make any distinctions between your emotions and your soul? Well, I don't, necessarily in the sense that emotions, which for me are, are a kind of manifestation of truth, and soul is truth, so emotions and truth and soul, there's a kind of a triangle being played out there in language. But I, I think it, it's too abstruse to, to go into that, you know, those definitions, because what we're really doing with the question and answering is we're actually getting into language, which is getting away from emotions and getting away from soul. Language is its own domain, and it's a wonderful domain, and I love language. But when we start talking in language about emotions and soul, we kind of miss the boat. Where is the boat? The boat is in the harbour. And, um... It's Where boats belong. Because in an interview you can't really have pauses, can you? Sure you can, because she can cut them out. Hi, Isabel. Uh, that's the amazing but thing the about this weird thing, because actually we're in a triangle as well. So if I was body, you were soul, and she was mind, we can't pretend that it's just body and soul because mind is always there, you know. So that's why it's really important that Isabel says something now. Um, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Great. So, so that nexus, that relationship 
is unequivocal to the situation, even though until this point we've only seen, we still haven't seen Isabel, but we've only heard the two of us. So that's a really good illustration about the fact that soul is always there, even if you can't see or hear it. I mean, the medium is, is a very good metaphor for what's really going on, because all we are is media. You know, in the same way that a camera mediates this situation, we mediate the relationship between soul and mind. And when did you first discover a camera? Well, I mean, I discovered the camera. I first discovered a camera, it's a very interesting question, in 1972, in November, when I went to London for the first time. I went to a place called Barnes, and my mother bought me what was called an Instamatic camera. Yeah, I buy them from my daughter. Okay, and, and, and I had this camera, and then I was eight years old. So that was when I first discovered the camera. But um, was it emotional? It, it, was, it was a little bit more torrential than emotional. It was really like... A, it, was, it, was, it was fundamental. It was, it was eruptive. It was like a volcano and a typhoon and a storm and an earthquake and a hurricane and a tidal wave and a nuclear explosion and 48 orgasms all at once. It was, was really important, was significant. And, and so, what did you take pictures of? Uh, my feet. Why? Well, I was born with club feet, so I used to always be, as a kid, I used to wear, wear these heavy shoes, and, and I had these scar marks from where the muscles were taken out. So I was very self-conscious of my feet. So when I had this camera, the first thing I thought of taking photographs of was my feet, so that I could look at them and not feel ashamed of them. Mermaid. I'm definitely like the little mermaid, except my tail isn't quite as long as hers. Yeah, <laughs> I've got other qualities, what the? And, um, um, but it's nice, nobody's called me a little mermaid for at least a year. Thank you. I like that. And so, so, what about Earth? We've talked about emotions, but what about the Earth? So, how. What, what, are you a down-to-earth person? Yes. But I would like to Despite say... Despite your feet, your tortured feet. Yeah, I like to say I'm more an up-to-earth person. <laughs> you see what I mean? So it's, we're spinning and it's crazy that we always think of the earth as underneath us when at least half of the time mm -hmm. the earth's on top of us and we're just not falling Actually, off the gravity. Actually, that's a really good way of putting it. For someone who experiences words as a limitation, it's a very good way of putting it. Right, yeah. we're done. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. I think we should really go and have the screening now. Thank you so much for the interview, Isabel. Thank, Thank you, you very much for this interview, it's been wonderful.